So today, as, uh, as you know, we have from uh, Kirksville in Missouri to Jason Hackstone. He's director of the Museum of Osteopathy at the Andrew Taylor Steel University. Um, well, from, from the ICO, we try to promote this classical osteopathic thinking, traditional thinking and philosophy. We run webinars like this one we have uh, done in the past with Jason, so you can check in the YouTube channel. And uh, the, the idea is to expand this thinking process of the pioneers of osteopathy, which we believe is the base, the foundation of osteopathy that we practice nowadays. The ICO headquarters, we are based in Dorking in the south of London, where we run the, the two years diploma that has to be canceled and postponed due to this COVID-19, which I hope you are all well in, in your own countries. Uh, even in Spain, even if, if the news are bad from Spain, we, we are okay, we are safe here. So hopefully we will start again in February 2021, uh, new and fresh, and um, hopefully the, this new uh, course goes about you know, mechanics, the, the applied mechanics, applied physiology, applied anatomy, and we try to get closer to, to the pioneers of, of osteopathy, of traditional osteopathy. So as I, I, I was saying tonight, we have a great presenter, a great speaker. He has been director of the museum for, uh, since 2001. And even though he's not an osteopath himself, I'm sure he could have a diploma, a well-deserved diploma, yes. He has been traveling around the world for many years and talking to many organizations and uh, different uh, schools. And, and to be honest, uh, from my point of view, thanks to his um, uh, immense knowledge uh, of osteopathy and all the research that they have done, him and all the team at Atsu, about still and the early osteopathy, I think we all have changed the views that we have an understanding about AT still. Uh, we have changed the attitudes towards the father of osteopathy. So if you go to Kirksville, which I really recommend, you will find him around the museum talking to medical doctors of the university or taking along to any of the many groups of foreign uh, osteopaths that we go to, to this center point of osteopathy, which is Kirksville. So hello, uh, Jason, and, and welcome. It's all yours. Diego, thanks so much. You and your brother Francisco have been friends for decades, and uh, uh, thanks for that warm welcome. Uh, as he mentioned, I am not an osteopath, but I do know a couple uh, techniques that I only use on my children, and then I require them to use them back on me. Um, what we um, know about osteopathy uh, and the classical osteopathy is the goal is to move the patient closer to health. And hopefully the talk we're giving today will have you learning a little bit more about yourself um, so that you can be a healthier practitioner. Because if you're going to help someone else, you need to have that solidness in yourself. You need to um, be taking good physical care of yourself, good mental care of yourself. And um, the talk today is that difficult area of mental health, um, understanding why we do what we do from the spirit and the mind part. Now, you guys know the body, the anatomy's there, the parts don't change, you learn the techniques, uh, and it's very consistent. But it's a little more challenging when you're dealing with something as elusive as um, the dweller within, as Dr. Still called it. We have the body, but there is this within dweller, and that is your spirit. And Dr. Still would advocate, do not touch the body, regardless of your manipulation skill, until you comprehend that within this body lies a spirit. And that is what it's about. It's kind of like walking around a car and looking at a car and the driver's in it and ignoring the driver. It's like the car is very nice, but the person inside is what controls and moves the car and the car basically serves. And so we need to understand that although we can work on the body, there is a special element of spirit. And again, I, I want to tell you about that because I think it's really a great thing. So I'm going to share a PowerPoint that we have. There it is. Uh, thank you, Pindy. You are amazing. And now we are sharing. And I'm going to get this down. And again, I, I can't thank enough the Institute for Classical Osteopathy 
um, for hosting uh, this uh, program. I've worked a lot with uh, uh, the Wernham students and, uh, and Maidstone and seeing the offices and, and the good work. I think this was began back in 1956 or something like that, which is incredible. <laughs> it actually is older than me, and there's not many things older than me. And so again, I want to thank uh, the ICO for having and this is one of my favorite pictures of Dr. Still. I call it the kindly Dr. Still. There's such a calmness and just a peacefulness about him. Um, we're coming up on 103 years this December. It'll be 103 years since Dr. Still has been gone. And yet his ideas uh, are growing and stronger, both in the United States and the world. We've gone from his one little school to, um, I think we're at 58 medical schools of osteopathy in the United States. That's really quite impressive. 25% of all physicians in the United States, family physicians, are DOs. So from one man, 25% of all people served come through his program. So you know it's pretty impressive. And that's only been going on for 100 years. Uh, this is his gravesite. I was just there the other day. Um, and again, uh, it's a very peaceful place to go. As I mentioned, um, Dr. Still came up with a fairly new idea, which was the whole person treatment. So we have the body, the anatomy, the physical, which you guys uh, as osteopaths should be very good at. But then we have the mind, which is a little tricky, and the spirit, which is completely intangible. So how the mind and the spirit connect then to the body, that these three um, work well together. Uh, I want to take you on a journey of the mind-spirit. Uh, because it is the area we get the least of. And sometimes people are worried. It's like, whoa, 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 I can't do mind-spirit. That's like counseling. That's like psychiatry. That's like uh, psychology. That's, that's beyond my ability. What we're teaching you are simple ideas about people. And it doesn't make you a certified counselor or a psychologist or a psychiatrist for that matter. What it does is it teaches you to interact. And we're interacting with people every day, and you're not basically um, <laughs> uh, sued for fraud. <laughs> so even now, I'm working with you, and even though I am uh, a counselor, what I'm saying is personal interactions happen. And so they're certainly going to happen with your clients. And what I want you to do is understand yourself, why you do what you do, and then through the prism, you will be able to reflect and see more about your patients. So what we're all about is seeking health to prevent disease. And that can be through physical activity, diet, exercise, and mental health. And when things are out of whack, we need to put them back into whack. Or as we would say, we have to take things that are out of alignment or out of normal back to normal. And just as your body can get twisted and you can have the ribs and muscle stress, so can the mind get little twists that need to help get you back into perspective. And so we're going to learn some um, more about that. Now, this is a fun thing that someone once asked Dr. Still. How do you know when a person needs an osteopathic treatment? And Dr. Still said, well, when you see a person and if their clothes are too loose, like this gentleman in the suit, <laughs> you can tell this guy, his pants don't fit, his shirt is, you know, not fitting, his tie is too big, his jacket, it doesn't fit. Now, do you know when a person's clothes are too tight? Well, we've got examples, and maybe that's a fashion these days, because I see a lot more tighter clothes, or maybe it's because Americans are getting fatter, and Europeans are following that trend, too. There's a 20% increase in obesity in Europe since 1986. So what I'm saying is you can tell when clothes are too tight. And what Dr. Still says, just as when clothes are too big or too tight and don't fit, you can see it. And when you look at a person, if their body is not fitting them, then they need an adjustment. That's when they need a treatment. So again, think about this as you look at people and, uh, understand when things aren't fitting. But what I want to prepare you for is what happens when the mind and the spirit aren't fitting? How do you make that adjustment? How do you interact with the intangible? And so again, it's going to be, I think, a, a eye-opening lesson for you guys today. 
there's that handsome devil me. <laughs> so I got my degree in counseling. So I can actually do counseling. Um, but I also was trained to train other people. And as I finished my degree, I learned all the theory. I knew all the names. I knew all the techniques. But I really didn't feel like I could help someone. I didn't, I didn't feel the confidence that I could do any good. And maybe some of you sometimes feel that way in osteopathy. You've, you've learned the anatomy. You've basically figured out how to do the crunches and the, and the long lever techniques and soft tissues. But then you wonder when the patient actually comes in, can I really do something with them? There is that kind of doubt that can you put this knowledge together and use it? And so for a long time, I felt kind of like a fraud that I knew the stuff, but I didn't know how to use the material that I had learned over three or four years of counseling. And that is when I came uh, across an idea that works for almost every person and worked for myself. So getting back to the classical aspect of this, <clears throat> we need to understand Dr. Still. So we have access <clears throat> to a great deal of material. We have thousands of pages of writings of Dr. Stills that were never published. And we keep those kind of in a back area. They were in a big box that the family just gave to us. And I would love to just sit down and just go over these ideas. And a lot of the material you're going to see comes from Dr. Stills' personal material that he didn't share. He didn't share because he didn't think the times were right, that, that the people and, and the politics would permit these ideas to flow. As we were talking today, there are platforms like Twitter and Facebook and, and all kinds of areas where ideas are freely shared and people can learn in that way. Dr. Still knew these times were coming, and so he wanted ideas that could be expressed and not blocked. And so when he was asked, he'd be writing these notes every day and he'd be putting them in a box and people were like, is that going to be your next book? He's like, no, 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 no. He's like, well, what is that? He goes, ah. He goes, I cannot be happy and idle. I'm going to use my pen and I'm going to feed the coming minds as best I can. So he was preparing this material for you. And so I think it's great that I get to share it, that it was just like a little time capsule. He knew the time would come, and hopefully someone, and, and that gets to be me, would share these ideas. One of the things we know about Dr. Still was that he didn't follow the normal rules, that he really worked with all people, all colors, all ages, all races, uh, all social, economic, poor, wealthy. Dr. Still saw pain as pain, and his job was trying to relieve the suffering in your journey of life. There was a student who, his first interaction uh, with Dr. Still was long before there was an osteopathic school. Dr. Still would just go around and treat people. And he said that um, he was walking between the church area and there he saw Dr. Still sitting on the sidewalk um, with a Negro man, a black man in front of him. And of course this is unusual because segregation would not permit blacks and whites to be interacting. I mean, unless they were doing a job for you, you wouldn't just socialize. So it struck this white student odd. So he kind of came over to see what was going on here. He said the doctor was manipulating the bones in the man's wrist. They were apparently very stiff and couldn't move. But Dr. Still was able to get the carpal bones that were dislocated to um, start to give him some access to move so he could work again. And Dr. Still said a couple more treatments and you'll be, you'll be pretty good. So for this student, it was the first lesson in osteopathy, not only the fact that you could loosen stiffness in joints, but you shared it with all people. This is another example of Dr. Still's openness at a time that wasn't very open. Um, he had built the brand new brick building. He had had the little schoolhouse with just about 21 students, but now we had you know, 300 students wanting to attend the college. So he needed a bigger facility. So after this big brick infirmary, which is a clinic, and then the back portion being the, the classes, the, the school area, he opened it up for the city, of course, and all the wealthy white community came. But a week later, he reopened it 
just for the colored, the black community. He told them, you built this. It was the labor, the bricklayers and stuff were the black community goods. You built this. I want you to use this. I wish there had been more of you that came today, but you tell your friends, this is for you too. And again, we see Dr. Steele's openness to the people that were the poorest and probably the least educated and, and probably the most unhealthy. And he was encouraged them to come and get help. Now, maybe they thought, well, we don't have any money. Well, the thing about Dr. Still is word got around is Dr. Still would treat you whether you had money or not. And so we see another example. I love this, this uh, photograph because here you see this black woman, probably no money for a camera, uh, dressed in her finest, standing in front of Dr. Still and Dr. Still's wife in this carriage. They're celebrating osteopathy being legalized. And yet she felt the comfort to get in the picture with Dr. Still, knowing that she wouldn't be chased away, not by Dr. Still at least. And that is her immortality. We'll never know who she is, but forever this woman, this proud woman, you know, wanting to be historically forever connected to Dr. Still in a photograph. And so we know from, from history that um, often uh, the poor black uh, patients would come and they wouldn't have any money. And Dr. Still would treat them anyway. And they, they, you know, and not only would he treat them, he'd often give them a little couple of dollars to get back home, to take the train and go back where they came from. Uh, money never motivated Dr. Still. As a matter of fact, if he had a dollar, he gave it away. Um, he could hunt. He could build his own shelter. Um, he could get what he needed to survive. So everything else was extra. And money had no control over him. And so he would treat um, the patients as they arrived, first come, first serve. And it didn't matter if a poor black person was sitting in the first chair and maybe the Speaker of the House, the second most powerful person, Mr. Forker, came to Kirksville next to the president. This is the most powerful person in the United States in government. And Mr. Forker was told to wait his turn because this woman was first. And just because you got lucky or you had a little bit of success, you know, you will get your turn. And when it is your turn, you will get my total focus. And people like Mr. Forker, if they were smart, they liked that because they knew that there would no, not be any game playing, that you would get what you needed and you would get it honestly. And so people really, really realized what Dr. Stir was about. And think about it. Just because you're poor, if you're hurting, your pain isn't any less than the wealthy billionaire or, or the president or anyone else. Pain is pain. And Dr. Still tried to relieve it for all people. Now, we're all gonna die, but Dr. Still wanted this journey to be as pleasant as possible. And if you can go through this journey with less pain, this life and experiences, then that was the better. But Dr. Still always made it clear, we're not gonna stop death. We might slow it down. We might procrastinate it but we can't stop death. But let's help patients have an enjoyable journey. You know, you get very difficult patients, sometimes cerebral palsy. They just bring them off the streets and students would be saying, here's our patient today. And in would come a person with cerebral palsy, a horrible situation, possibly at birth, a lack of oxygen, the nerve damage. This person will, to our knowledge, shake their whole life. And Dr. Still would say, this is cerebral palsy. Students, we cannot cure it. But we can do things that give this person better quality. We can make their life easier. We can give them more comfort, and we will do that. So don't worry that you'll get patients that you cannot cure. Often, you can give them something that is better than nothing. You can ease the pain some. And if you're in pain, any help is accepted and appreciated. And we're gonna look at the pain that can be spiritual and mental. They're coming into you and maybe they're being treated for a slipped rib, but that person may also have additional health issues. Um, and I'm gonna teach you how to interact and find ways to ease that pain also. In that box of paper, this is one of those pieces of paper that we found in the box and I love this one. 
Dr. Still writes down, what was A.T. Still's religion? You know, everybody wanted to know, well, what's your religion? I mean, you know, you, you were with the Indians. Is it some great mystic Indian religion? Or your father was Methodist. You know, John Wesley from, from England. Are, 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 are you, you're Wesleyan. Are you, are, are you Methodist? And, and they were always trying to find out what Dr. Still's religion was. And finally, late in life, <laughs> one of those days when he was writing his little notes, it's like, I'll tell you what my religion is. My religion, love and justice for all. Wow. Love, connectedness with people, justice, fair, eliminating power, helping people basically get what they deserve. And first, I love and admire all the works of nature. I love this because of the harmonious perfection. I see perfection in the world, in the endless space, and all the universe, and while all the whirling and counter-whirling of the heavens above us, there are countless millions of stars, and yet there is no confusion from the greatest planet to the smallest satellite. The whole display in harmony. <laughs> the perfection of things working. And Dr. Still saw us as part of that perfection. We're not separate from nature. We are nature. And in his appreciation of this harmony, he was appreciating humans too. So his religion, simple, be fair, love everyone. So getting to that harmony of the human, Dr. Still in his autobiography tells us how he has this epiphany, how he has this kind of awakening about who he is. He tells us in this little kind of poem uh, that's in his autobiography that through all the darksome night, I lay enchained in slumber's thrall. Okay, so he's passed out and he's asleep. <laughs> but with the first faint flushings of the dewy morn, I arose and I wandered forth. So he goes outside. And all nature seems to wait in hushed expectancy. You see, when it's dark, the vibrations slow. And everything, there's less movement. And so you can really connect. There's less information. You can really connect to what's going on. With an iron hand of will, I barred the gates of my memory. I shut out the past and all my old ideas. My soul took on a receptive attitude. My ear was tuned to nature's rhythmic harmony. So again, he just tried to not think, to just be and just experience. And over the billowy briny deep, of course, if you're in England, the ocean, <laughs> I saw the faint shafts of light arise, enriching with rosy tint, the pallor of dawn. So you see that red coming. And then the red disc of the sun peeped a little bit, and then spring in full orb fiery from night's embrace, and kiss the world to awakening beauty, and then everything starts moving, the vibration. My spirit was overwhelmed with the immeasurable magnitude of the deathly plan of the universe's construct, that everything's in harmony, and I'm in harmony. I need to take care of myself to tune to this harmony. And so this is where we look at bringing ourselves health, looking in nature and learning to gain health as part of this world. So he had an, an amazing ability to understand people. He observed, I mean, look at how he describes, you know, night to morning and explosion into dawn. He would observe the, the details of what was happening. And so um, when you, you look at what people are doing, like my choice to share with you today, I feel that learning about bodies and mind and spirit and this counseling mind spirit aspect really made me a better person on the journey. So my job is to love people and want you to gain this knowledge. And so maybe Dr. Still, by observing people, he was a natural counselor. I had to be trained in college, but he observed and picked it up. And so he was always looking for cause and effect. What's going on here? And we're going to talk more about this. So in his definition of osteopathy, he says, among other things, 
it's biology, chemistry, it is psychology. So there is the very physical elements, but there is the very mental elements of osteopathy. Tucker's uh, book, this was a patient who became a student, who became a faculty member. So he knew, Dr. he knew Ernest Tucker for 17 years. But what Tucker says about Dr. Still was, it was instant soul to soul. He didn't have time for the niceties, the shallow dialogue, mm, the weather. Oh, those are nice shoes. You wanted to do that with Dr. Still, you'd get cut off. If you were open, heart to heart, he would connect. Fulford, one of the students of Dr. Still, and if you look at Fulford's vibration and basically working with the energy of the patient, Fulford says, how you work with the patient, how you connect, is just love them. As Dr. Still says, love everyone. Because if you're worried about the bills and you're picking up your kids for soccer and what are you gonna have for dinner? Oh my gosh, and I gotta get that paper done in two days. If you're thinking about all these things, you're not gonna connect to your patient. But if you remove everything and only look at caring and love, you don't have room for another thought. If you're totally absorbed in caring and loving this patient, their improvement, there's nothing else, and you will lock in and be able to give a better treatment. So soul to soul, what Dr. Still teaches us. And then he had to say this about the physical body. I've given you the principles, you guys go figure it out. There's always a new technique. There's always a new way of doing something. But what I want to understand is the entangled element of the spirit. What is that thing that's not the body? Because I'd like to grab a piece of it and get it under a microscope and look at that spirit, but I can't. It's very difficult. And so Dr. Still saved mind spirit after he figured out the anatomy, because that was the easy part. This was the hard part. And now I'm going to kind of lead you to some of the ideas that go with this. But again, as I said in his um, description, Osteopathy includes the human mechanism of anatomy and physiology and psychology. So what I want to move us to is William Glasser, who is a doctor, a physician, and a psychiatrist, so he deals with the mind. Um, he recently died. I had the unique opportunity of not only learning from him as a student, but I got to become part of his faculty to teach his ideas. The ideas of William Glasser, and though you may not remember his name, you may have heard his idea called reality therapy. What Dr. Glasser had to say was kind of like what Dr. Still had to say about medicine, only Glasser was working with the mind. A.T. Still said, bleeding, poisoning, burning, medicine of my time doesn't work. If anything, it kills people. So I'm going to find a better way. I'm going to start with the basics health, diet, exercise, your thoughts, and alignment. And we will build a system of health care on these simple ideas. And that's how we ended up with osteopathic health care today. Glasser was the same way. As he finished up his psychiatry degree, he said it doesn't work for the average person. He goes, I, I, I feel there's got to be something that can work with people mentally and help them. Psychiatry of what I'm learning isn't. And so he basically comes up looking at psychiatry of the day, which is mental health, and says, you know, three things. Mental illness, labeling mental illness, it doesn't do a service. About half the time, it isn't right anyway. But if you label someone, and it, it basically prevents them from moving beyond that label. They are a spirit, a person, not the mental health label you've given them. And so, as he said, don't think of labels for people. The second thing he said was psychotropic magic medications. He didn't deny medications were needed, but he said they were only to be temporary to give the body a chance to rest and then for the person to move on. 
But what we do is we put people permanently on uh, psychotropic drugs. And when your physical thinking is controlled by the drugs, you will never basically be in control of it. And again, I'm just saying what he in general is saying about the average person. There are always outliers and, and extreme cases. But what he's saying is in general, trying to subdue someone's mental processes, a, a person with normal problems with drugs isn't going to help them. And then the last part is feelings. People always want to talk about my feelings. I got these feelings, all these effing feelings. Those that know Lana Del Rey, <laughs> she's out of control with her feelings. That's what she's saying. My feelings just overwhelm me. I can't even do anything. And this is what people tell you. It's like, I can't do anything. It's, I'm, I'm depressed. I, I'm so depressed. I can't do it. I can't work. I can't think. I can't take care of my family. It's these feelings. And Glasser says it's feelings. They are what we don't want to draw on. There are ways to control the feelings. And we're going to talk about that. Because some of you probably have feelings out of control or know somebody with their feelings out of control. Feelings are only a signal. They're no more a signal than if I sit here long enough and keep drinking this water, my bladder is going to get full. And my body's going to say, hey, you need to get rid of some of this water. Go take a break. <laughs> But you know, I'm in the middle of this talk and I can't go take a break. So, and I keep drinking more water. And my body gives me this other signal. It's like, oh, pain. You need to go relieve this water. It's just a signal. But I don't. If I sit here long enough and don't go to the back, I can literally poison my system. And I'm going to be in such horrible pain. Now, if I just go and go to the bathroom, it's over. We're back to normal. Feelings are that way. They're a signal to tell you you're getting what you want. You're not getting what you want. But once you get the signal, then you respond, like getting up and going to the bathroom. Once you're sad, then you need to get emotionally up and take care of that or angry. Or if you're happy, live in it. But feelings of themselves don't help to sit and talk about them. It's more helping you think how you can turn those around. So it is a different way of thinking about things. So what Dr. Glasser also says is your behavior, and behavior was a word I never liked because I didn't know what it was. It's an action. It's like right now I'm just talking to you. My behavior is sitting here on a Zoom, chit-chatting with you. What you're doing. Uh, if you're out mowing, if you're driving a car, whatever you're doing, just having a conversation, watching, behavior is a doing thing. So whatever action is happening is your behavior. But here's the thing. Every behavior has a series of components. One is, what are you doing? I'm sitting here chatting. While I'm chatting, there is also thinking going on. And from thinking, feelings start to be tied into that. And once the feelings kick in, there is a physiology. If I start to think this isn't working, I might be thinking this isn't working. And I might be feeling, I don't know what to do. And then my body starts to sweat and I start blinking. <laughs> All I'm saying is your behaviors give you away. There's a doing component. There's a thinking component. There's a feeling component. And then the body kicks in and there's a body doing something. And uh, whether my breathing takes up or, or maybe my body relaxes or maybe it tenses up. All we're saying is there's always a physiological effect in a behavior along with everything else. And so what we're helping is people get a hold of this to not be out of control, to not be victims of their feelings. Um, so like Dr. Still said, let's begin with health. Glasser said, Let's begin with the oldest thing we know about our cave person <laughs> community. We know that we need to, to survive. So if we go to what people do, what their action is, they're either fighting, meaning it's working, 
or they're fighting, meaning I'm running away. I always love Monty Python because, you know, they charge in after, you know, the castle. It's like, come on, let's go get them. And then they start getting things thrown. And he's like, oh, run away. <laughs> this isn't working. And so I, I always think of that as fight or flight. You know, they see a little rabbit. Ah, it's just a little bunny rabbit. It's like, ah, you know, it's like, no, it's a horrible creature. It's like, it's a rabbit. Go in there and knock off the rabbit's head. It goes in there, the rabbit's like, mm, it's a vicious rabbit. It's like, oh, my gosh, you know, run away. It's like, <laughs> it's not what we thought. And this is the way we are with our actions. If it's working, hang in there. If it's not working, do something else. But the problem is, it's not working sometimes and people don't do something else. Osteopathy, it's a great profession and career. If it's working for you, do more of it. But if you're not feeling confident, it's not working for you, then find something that will work for you. So we're constantly deciding, good and stick with it isn't good run away. Here's an example. We're in the area where we get a lot of snow. And sometimes when you're in the snow, and you can, those of you that are in Argentina, you can use beaches. <laughs> sand. Sand and snow are a lot alike. If you get stuck in snow or you get stuck in sand, sometimes you put on a little gas and boom, you get out of it. But sometimes you put on that gas and you hear that, and you know, the car is stuck. Now, some people keep pushing on that gas, even though they're not getting out. And they will push on that gas until the car is completely buried in that snow. And then they'll still push the gas. And here's the weird thing. They'll run out of gas completely because they've been doing this for hours. And even though there's no gas, they'll still be pushing on the gas pedal. This is, if something isn't working, <laughs> stop. <laughs> and do something else. And that's the problem with people. People don't want to admit it isn't working. And so we need to help them is this isn't working. <laughs> I'm going to show you something. Actually, this is for another program on uh, 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 about fat that I'm going to be giving in Germany. <laughs> and so I'm going to, I'm going to share something that isn't working. Look at that. Oh my God, that's not working. I'm shoving down snacks and stuff. It was not working. And my wife and my daughter said, Dad, you know, are you going to just keep getting fat? And it's like, yeah. <laughs> so one day I started eating half the amount of food. And I didn't need the other half. And then I started walking. And what I'm saying is I actually got into this amazing health that I am today. <laughs> All I'm saying was it wasn't working for me. And the only person who could stop it was me. And one day I just had a look in the mirror and it's like burying my car in snow or saying, stop, do something different. You know, again, stop burying your car in the snow, get a piece of cardboard, call a tow truck. But what you're doing isn't working. At some point you need to say, this isn't working. And this is how relationships are too. If they're not working and you've tried, Maybe it's just not going to work. Um, and we're going to explain. I'm going to get to why I say that. And you'll understand what I mean is what you can try. And if it still doesn't work, then it's up to you to decide if you want to stay in that or not. Um, so this is where we come to. Remember, Dr. Still, I told you, wasn't really motivated by money um, because he had his survival skills. He could get food. His clothes were ample. He could build a shelter. He could protect himself. So these are the basic needs. If you don't have survival needs, you can't move to the others. You know, if you're worried about eating, it's hard to move on to other things. But what we're saying is you need to have the basics. And the other thing is, if you want to help someone, you need to be connected. You need to be soul to soul. You need to show them that you're there for them and build a relationship. Because if you just stop and, 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 and don't really try to get involved, it's really hard through Zoom. You know, I'd much rather you guys be in person because there is then a connection that you don't get as strong through Zoom. So I kind of miss the one-on-one -on -one personal connection. But all I'm saying is because it's easier to connect. I'm hoping we're connecting. It's a little more challenging. But by sharing stories, 
by showing you I really want to help, I want you to be better people. Maybe we do connect a little bit, but what I'm saying is with that client on your table, to do them any good, you need to connect. And how you connect? Four things, and I just placed them right here on the side. Power, belonging, fun, and freedom. These are the four motivators of humans. Like you need food and water and warmth and shelter, you need power, belonging, fun, and freedom. These are the mental foods. And your patient sitting on that table with that twisted back equally needs these things to be healthy, mental health. Now, for those of you that speak Spanish, I put this in Spanish. <laughs> but those of you that speak English, it's in English too. Uh, and again, part of having fun. Um, so power, people think, well, I don't want power. Dr. Stone never wanted power. Power is not good or bad. We make it seem like it is, but power, you just know if you have it. Power can be skill. And if you can do osteopathy and you can take a twisted body and have them go out in alignment and feeling better, that is power. Knowledge, I get to dig around in Dr. Still's stuff, so I know things that a lot of people don't know. That's a power. It's not good or bad. But sharing that knowledge, skill. Um, so we know when we have power, power can be money because money lets you buy things if you have money. It certainly is powerful. People need a sense of power. But remember, that's where we come with fairness. You know, when Dr. Still says fairness, if things are fair, there is a power in that, that you will get what you deserve and belonging, love connection. We need this. Children need this. When children are born, if they're not given, they can be given food, changed clothing, but if they're not given love and connection, they will wither and die. It's called marasmus. We saw this after some horrible wars. So many mothers and fathers gone, and these babies, they barely had time to feed, change, and, 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 and get them just clean. But the babies needed more. They needed belonging. You can have belonging with a pet. You can have it with a favorite shirt, with a piece of jewelry, a ring. We get belonging from all kinds of music. We connect to certain bands. Lana Del Rey, you want to get to my heart? That poor woman who's always getting her heart broken, I can just feel for her. <laughs> when I want to get get on a long walk, I just put on good old Lana, you know, and, and listen to her songs on love or uh, a variety of things. Anyway, Blue Jeans, another great song. Anyway, we get belonging from music and, and love. We also need to have fun. And I hope we've been having fun. You know, when you're learning something, it's fun. That's what fun is. And nature rewards us with a laugh. A laugh is a good feeling to encourage you to do more, that aha moment. So when we are learning and figure things out, it's fun. We need that and freedom. We need to be able to have choices and options. So these are the four things, power, belonging, fun, and freedom. Every action is trying to get those for your mind. My little sports car, whoa, power good looking, freedom. I've owned these little sports cars since I was out of, out of college for, so gosh, almost 40 years. So there's a connection. People look at you and envy you. That's power. And the freedom. I mean, I can just go anywhere in it. I put the top down and I feel the air. All I'm saying is, I know why I have sports cars. Why am I going from <laughs> this <laughs> to this? Because power, I feel better. I can run faster. I can lift more weights. People look at you and say, damn, you know, I belong with those people that are working out and also want to get healthy. It's kind of fun. As much as I say I hate it, you can always do different ways of improving yourself. Food that you eat, freedom. You get to figure out how to move on that path. So what I'm saying is people that choose healthy, why well, have this haircut? Everything you do centers around these things. You purple, people don't want to fail. People don't want to go bad. When someone's edgy, that edginess is their power. 
you know, that extreme golf look and haircut and black lipstick. It's like, what? That's their power to challenge the establishment. And they have belonging with friends that are like them who get it. And they get to, again, have fun and freedom. But this comes back to the marriage talk. Remember, I'm saying, if you're in a relationship, and if it's a young one, you're probably getting a lot of power, sharing power. Oh, hubby, my love, you are just so smart and so handsome and so sexy. Gosh, that feels good. Belonging. I only want to be with you till the day I die. You know, I'll do anything for you. I'll die for you. Belonging. Fun. Let's learn about life together. Let's have a kid. Oh, my gosh, it's so much work. Freedom. You know, you can have your thoughts, and I will still be there for you. As long as you're getting these things, that relationship will work. But at some point, maybe someone wants to control the money, control you, control what's going on. You don't get any say. You don't get any power. Belonging, they insult you. They don't care for you. They call you fat and stupid and ugly. There's no belonging. Fun. They go out and have fun with the boys and leave you at home. Freedom. Getting to be yourself. You do what I say, how I say it. You can really see how a relationship can change from getting these things to not getting these things. And all I'm saying is, if you're in divorce court <laughs> or you're seeing a counselor, somebody isn't getting these things. Now, you can find a way to get them, and maybe it'll work out. But if someone's not willing to change, then it's not going to be there. And then you need to, are you going to spin your tire? Are you going to bury yourself? Are you going to push on the gas pedal when there's no gas? Or are you going to do something different? So again, marriage counseling is very easy. You explain to people, these are what you're wanting. Are you getting them? Are you going to help each other get them? Because if there's no investment, there's no belonging. Why stay with someone who doesn't want to have belonging with you, who doesn't want to share fun and power? So again, this is important, but this is with kids too. This is with jobs. You have a job, you love it, it's great, and suddenly you get a new boss, and suddenly they're telling you what to do, and your ideas are horrible. And no, you'll do it this way because I say so. All I'm saying is things change, and either you can change with them, um, and find other ways to get these things. Pets, you know, again, anything in your life, your skills, your music, your hobbies, your hobbies feed these things. They make you feel good about what you're doing. You're learning, you feel in tune with it. All I'm saying is, and your patients are no different. We're talking about you, because if this is true in you, it's true in your patient. Um, so I remember this gal in Canada, and uh, she's an East Indian, and uh, of course, Canadian now. And she, um, she had a patient that was coming in to see her. And the woman was probably maybe in her early 70s, pretty healthy for, for that age. And yet she would come in saying, I'm in great pain. And so she would get her on the treatment table and she'd kind of do the total, the Wernham total body adjustment with her and stuff. And there really wasn't anything really wrong with her. And she would talk to the woman and she would go over all parts of the body. And she called me up and said, ah, this woman comes. I spend time with her. We talk. I check her all out. I can't find anything. And then she wants to make an appointment to come back in a month. I feel like a fraud. I am not osteopathically fixing anything. And yet she keeps saying she's in pain and wants to come back. I said, does she have a husband? Nah, he died. She, she lives alone in an apartment. Kids? Well, yeah, but they're grown up. They're gone. They're in other places doing their things. Any pets? No. She working? now. she's retired. So does she get out much? Except for groceries, probably coming here. I said, you're giving her power. You're listening to her. You're taking time for her. Here you are, this young, wonderful profession and belonging. You truly do care for her. You care her. You wouldn't feel like a fraud. You must, she must feel that care. I mean, imagine this person who truly wants to help you. So you're listening. You're trying to help. You're giving her freedom to get out of that little apartment. 
and when she's with you, she's probably having a little fun. You are osteopathically helping her with her mental needs. You're right. Her physical body probably is fine, and the adjustment probably doesn't matter that much, though you can always make someone a little better. But not to the degree you think that you need to see her every month. But she is getting something. And now that you understand it, you can talk to her more about ways that she might get more belonging, joining a group, get more power. Does she have a hobby, something that can occupy her during those lonely days? Something that she can do and learn from, some more learning. Stop being in the rut. Challenge her to do something she hasn't done. And, you know, basically help her look at options. What I'm saying is, you already got them on the table for 45 minutes. <laughs> What are you going to do? I mean, granted, you can talk while you're working um, and and you can address some of these things with, with all. And it's not counseling. It's just communication. But you're communicating on topics that help people get better. Love and be loved. Dr. Still's favorite signature when he give a boy a book. I love to love and be loved. Don't you? Here Dr. Still is in the middle with his wife, kids, friends. Fun. Ride a bike. Learn something new. Don't do what you did yesterday. Okay, let's get up to those feelings because you're thinking, okay, Jason, I can do all that stuff, but what about this feeling and this thinking? Well, I took for, uh, I have a commercial art degree, so, um, you know, I had to learn about art. And I remember the Greeks. And if we look here at this statue uh, on, on the far side, this man, I always remember that it's like, this is classical Greek. I think of classical being like the epitome, the best. I think, and look at this guy. He's friggin' bored. Here he is, he's got this great pump body and, uh, and, and his naughty bits showing, but he, he has no emotion. He's just sitting there, just absolutely calm as a cucumber. Just nothing phases me. I thought, this isn't real. People aren't like this. How can Greeks think that this is the highest form of art? Then their, their country started to fall into ruins. The Romans were taking them over, things like that. And suddenly they went to the artwork this far side. This is called Hellenistic. Look at this old, but first she's old. Here, this is a young guy and pump. There's not a wrinkle on his body. He doesn't have anything that, that looks like age. Here's an old woman. She's got the same turkey neck, got the wrinkles going on. Her muscles are starting to, you know, scarpinia. And, and she's up there and she's got kind of like, ah, she's drunk. She's been drinking. She's a drunk. Oh my God. This is real. This is high artwork. You know what the Greek said? This is perverse. This is gross. This is the fall of our, basically, country. I'm thinking, what's wrong with them? That? And this? This is real. That's because I didn't understand feelings. The Greeks understood a lot. Remember, they gave us our, our government system. They came up with science, medicine. My gosh, the Greeks did everything. And if they said, this is good, they've got to know something. And that's what they're saying. When you have a feeling, use it, and then go to your thinking about what's going on here. It doesn't mean you don't have emotions. It just means your emotions do not overwhelm you. It doesn't mean you don't cry, but you don't cry uncontrollably for weeks on end. You know, and you don't get angry, or you get angry, but you don't let it destroy your life and be, you know, every part of your day. We know that, that these kinds of things uh, upset the nervous system in the body. What the Greeks said was, use the feeling as a signal, I didn't get what I wanted, or I got what I wanted. And then, what do you do next? So, change your thinking and your feelings fall. Your feelings aren't controlling you. They're the tail on the dog. <laughs> when the tail wags, big deal, the rest of the do dog isn't being shook around. We call that, don't let the tail control the rest of the animal. The dog is in control. 
thinking controls the tail, the feelings. So as an example, I would tell you, um, imagine an apple. I mean, everybody knows what an apple is. So imagine, think about an apple. Just for a minute, close your eyes and let's think apples. What is your apple? Is it red? Some people might have green apples, yellow. Is it sweet? Is it tart? Is it really shiny? Does it have a lot of like flaws on it? All I'm saying is you see, as you're thinking about an apple, there's all these different, maybe it's mixed yellow and, and pinkish and red. All I'm saying is when you think apples, there's all these apples. Okay. We got what thinking's about. Feelings. What I want right now is for you to be happy. I want you to feel happiness. I want you to feel such happiness that you laugh. So think of the last time you laughed and you probably were happy. So what made you laugh? Be happy. And in order to be happy, you have to remember and think about something that made you laugh. Okay. I want you to be sad. Now, nobody wants to be sad. But this is a lesson. I want you to be sad. How do you be sad? You think of something that's sad. I'm going to tell you a real sad story. Right now, do I look sad? No, I'm happy. I'm, I'm, I'm this guy over here. Everything's cool. I'm having fun. And, and I'm not being too extreme, I hope. But now I'm going to tell you how, how quickly feelings can change. Change your thinking, you change your feelings. So we were going to have a bunch of osteopaths, Dr. Blood, Dr. Ward, all these famous osteopaths. Some of them are dead now. But anyway, before they died, we wanted their stories. So we make this plan. It takes like, oh gosh, months to get these five osteopaths to come to Kirksville. We're going to videotape them. And all of a sudden I get a call from my sister saying, mom's not doing so well. She's got pneumonia and um, they think she's going to die. It's like, oh my gosh. I said, well, we had planned this event and it's like, I'm picking these guys up at the airport. Like, and I, I mean, well, what's mom saying? She goes, well, that's the weird. She goes, mom just stares at the ceiling. I said, well, is she interact? No, she doesn't look at me. She doesn't talk. She just stares at the ceiling. It's like she's comatose. She just stares at the ceiling. Oh, if I show up, she won't even know I'm there. I set this big program up. I said, well, keep me informed as to what's going on. Okay, she goes, I will. But right now, nothing's going on. It's okay. So I go, I get the airport, I get the guys, we're bringing them, we're interviewing them. We get into things, it's a couple days in there. I'm calling back, how's mom? She's just staring at the ceiling. Okay, so I feel like, okay, you know, um, all the rest of my siblings have gone home. But, you know, I've got this big deal going on. I don't want to mess it up. And so, you know, we're interviewing, we get through it, and we get to like the third day in, and I call up my, I said, so how's mom? Um, she goes, oh, um, they're going to administer morphine. Um, they're going to give her a large amount of morphine, and she's, she's going to, um, she's going to die within hours. I said, oh. I said, was there any change? No change. I said, okay, well, just keep me informed. So after everything's done, I call up my sister and I said, so um, how's mom? Oh, you know, we were all here before they gave her a month. We talked with her. I said, talked with her? Oh, yeah. She, she had each of us. You know, there's, there, I have four other siblings. I have uh, three sisters and a brother. She goes, each one of us, she, she looked at and she gave each of us a word. Love. Faith. You know. It's like, what do you mean? She was catatonic. My sister was like, what? I said, she wasn't, she wasn't communicating. She was staring at the wall. She goes, no. I said, you told me she didn't recognize anybody. Oh, no. I said, oh, my God. I said, well, they've given her the morphine. It won't be long now. And I was like, oh. And so I said, well, keep me informed. 
course, the next day, it's like, mom's dead. No, she's not dead. So she's not dead. They don't know what, they've given her so much morphine and she's not dying. She, she keeps going under, but then she, it's as if she's drowning. She comes out and she looks wildly around him and she goes back under. Oh my God. She goes, it's horrible to be here. It's horrible. I said, okay. Um, she goes, they're, they're giving her more. It's going to be done. It's going to be done this afternoon. It's, it'll be over. I said, okay, well, let me know. It's another thing. I said, well, how's mom? She, she keeps coming out of this. She's frantic. And she can't breathe. And then she goes back under. This went on for three days. And then she finally died. I wonder, was she looking for her fifth child? Where was it? Where had it come? And as you can see, it's kind of sad. And that's what feelings are. You think things, are, I think how I wish I'd been there. And it's sad. But it was a misunderstanding. My sister, I love, and she is not an evil person. She would have never done anything to, you know, hurt me. And so as I think about this, I don't know how we got things crossed, but we did. See, this is just reality. Um, and, and in hindsight, somebody else could have taken those osteopaths and done the job. You know, it was, it would have still worked. And I, I learned never to do this again. That's what I learned from this. And I know my mom knows I loved her. And so I'm okay with that too. So you see, suddenly the sadness and, and if you change your thinking, my sister wasn't evil. My mom knows I loved her. It's unfortunate. Learn from it and move on. You see, this is how you can take these horrible things. Or I could sit in my pity pot and be angry with my sister and sad that my mom, and it doesn't do any good. You need to change your thinking and your feelings. I can't be sad when I start to think about what I really know. And then it goes away. Again, sadness was a signal, maybe not to do this again, but now, okay, I've taken care of it. I don't have to stay there. So thinking controls your feelings. And even with me, no matter how many times I tell that story, I always get sad because I'm thinking sad thoughts. And no, many times I tell the story, I always get over it because my thinking then pushes the feeling, not gets rid of them, but understands them. And they're okay. It's okay to be sad. But come on, I've got my own kids. I'm moving on. And if this journey is what Dr. Still says, I'm going to see my mom at the end anyway. This is just the spirit's journey. So, anyway, now you understand you've got patience. You yourself have thinking and feelings, and you have patience going through this. Help them change their thinking, and they'll change. Change what they're doing will change their thinking, change their physiology and get rid of the feelings. So again, finishing up, the only person who you can control is yourself. You can't make anyone do anything. You can understand them. You can give them information. I have given you information, but I haven't changed a single person. If you change because right now you're sad or in a bad relationship or feeling unconnected with your patients, maybe you will choose to do it differently. I can only give you information. And that's all Dr. Still did. You know, Dr. Still didn't leave people by the rope. He left a space so that you figured it out and you owned it. It was yours. And so almost all psychological problems are relationships. <laughs> Invariably, when you have a problem, it's a, it's a boss, it's a girlfriend, it's your kid, you know, it's your family. It's, you know, they're always relationships. Um, the problem relationship is usually in your present. It's not in the past. You know, somebody could victimize you as a child, and it's sad. But today, you're here, and you wouldn't let it happen. So the past is the past. What are you doing today? What happened in the past made us who we are, but it can't satisfy us. We need to continue in the future. You know, if you were abused as a child, 
that's a horrible thing. But today you're here and you're survived and you can make choices and think things and do things. And so again, this is what I wanted you to think about the mind and spirit. So how did Dr. Glasser came up with it? Kind of like Dr. Still. I don't know. It just seemed evident. <laughs> As I looked at people, these ideas seem to be the way it is. And so um, it made sense and it helped people. It, it wasn't genius. It was just noting things like Dr. Still noted about health and manipulation, that it helps people. He noted it and he shared it. And so this is where we see them very similar. If you want to know more, this is the book, Choice Theory, William Glasser. It says everything we've talked about. If you want to get better at this, this is a perfect book to do this. It's simple ideas of why you do what you do, how to get control of your life. It doesn't make you a machine to understand these things or to look at someone with these things. It makes your interactions more successful. It helps you do a better job. And so Dr. Still working with the patient, with that love, with that care, with that concern, with that empowerment. So I hope you've enjoyed our talk today. Stop sharing. <laughs> Thank you, Jason. Thank you very much. That was uh, uh, very touching to share that uh, history with us about the mom. Thank you. And uh, also thank you. I, I love that quote from uh, Atheist Steel about the religion, love and justice for all, for all. That is uh, one of the best things I heard so far. Yeah. Well, if we all did that, imagine how good the world would be. <laughs> and that was his journey. He says, we're only here for 80, 90 years, if you take care of yourself. But you come in a spirit, you experience this life, and you take that knowledge with you. Uh, to a greater thing. He goes, I know this is true. I know there's more because nature doesn't waste. Now, humans do waste, but nature conserves. So if we learn, learn, learn all of our life, we don't die and nature throws it away. There has to be a reason. There has to be an object. There has to be a purpose. Why are we learning today to take it with us to do a better job? So thank you for having me. Thank you very much. Um, I don't know if there are any questions from the audience that were listening very quietly. <laughs> any questions from Francisco here next to me? Hi, buddy. Hey. I want to ask you something, Jason. Okay. Yeah, the psychology as a science started only at the end of the 19th century. Did Dr. Steele already use the word psychology and went into it? Because I remember, if I remember, well, it started in Germany in the later years of the 19th century. I don't know if Dr. Steele already took on those ideas so quickly. Or they refer just the mind and the spirit, but not the word psychology as per se. And he uses this word uh, in 1896 um, in his autobiography, it, the first page is the definition, and it uses that word, uh, the psychology. And Little John, too. Um, Dr. Little John looks at osteopathy and psychology as one of his books. So probably, uh, I would imagine the ICO probably has that, um, that. It's not a very big book. It's a little yellow bound book that we have, too. It's very rare. But I do know that it's been, um, I think, reprinted. And um, so in osteopathy, it was looking at what is going on, that, that inner dweller, that spirit, that psychology? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Okay, thank you very much, everybody, is uh, saying thank you. How wonderful. And, and thanks for sharing all this information on the treatment table. That, uh, <laughs> it's, it's really nice to, to listen to it and, and to refresh the mind of how we have to interact with, with the patient and I think we, we must not forget about how we speak to them and talk to them. And it's the whole person. What I'm saying is if you see somebody that's struggling with weight, don't ignore it. Dr. Still says our job is to move each patient on their own speed to their best health, not your best health. I'm not expecting them to go to the gym and do an hour, but you can move the patient their exercise, their diet. You can talk about these things. 
how, where are they getting their needs fulfilled? Where are they getting their power? Where are they getting love? Where are they having fun? It's okay to ask these things. They will tell you. And actually, they will appreciate you wanting to know about that. And you can share back. This is how you get the connection. So you're right, Diego. Thanks so much. Yeah. Thank you very much. And I uh, hope uh, we see you soon. And all the best for the following weeks. Okay, Jason. Cheers. Bye-bye okay. now. Bye-bye. Yeah.